Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to the third event in this year's Humanities Lecture Series. I'm Victor Bailey, director of the whole center, which uh, puts the series together. It's our great pleasure this evening to bring you the critically acclaimed novelist, Joseph O'Neill. His novel, Netherland, amongst many other things, took me back to my own pitiful cricketing days in England and reminded me of the uh, 1980 Observer interview with playwright Harold Pinter a few days before Pinter's 50th birthday. Miriam Gross asked Pinter why cricket appealed to him so much. Said Pinter, I tend to believe that cricket is the greatest thing that God ever created on earth. <laughs> greater than sex, queried Gross? Certainly greater than sex. Everyone knows which comes first when it's a question of cricket or sex. All discerning people recognize that. He reminded Gross, however, that it wasn't necessary to do two things at the same time. You can either have sex before cricket or after cricket. But the fundamental fact is that cricket must be there at the center of things, as it was at the center of Netherlands. Mr. O'Neill will take questions after his talk, if you make your way to one of the uh, microphones. Uh, afterwards, in the room opposite this auditorium, there will be a reception for our guest speaker, uh, who will also sign copies uh, of his books, uh, and all are welcome to be there, so please join us. To introduce Joseph O'Neill, I've asked Laura Moriarty, Assistant Professor of English. Laura teaches advanced fiction writing and a graduate fiction workshop. In 2000-2001, thanks to the coveted Bennett Fellowship, she was writer in residence at the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. She's best known for her three novels, all published by Hyperion Books. The Center of Everything, 2003, which has nothing to do with cricket. The Rest of Her Life, 2007, and While I'm Falling, 2009. These novels have been selected for a number of book clubs, translated into other languages, and been selected by readers as fiction choices. Please welcome Professor Laura Moriarty. Good evening. Joseph O'Neill was born in Cork, Ireland in 1964 and has lived in Mozambique, South Africa, Iran, Turkey, and Holland. A naturalized American, he now writes for the Atlantic Monthly and resides in New York City where he's lived with his family for 10 years, for the last 10 years. His works include the novels This is the Life and the Breezes, as well as the nonfiction book Blood Dark Track of Family History which explores the suspected subversion and imprisonment of both of his grandfathers, one Turkish and one Irish, during World War II. O'Neill's third and most recent novel, Netherland, was published in May 2008. The New York Times noted that Netherland, like The Great Gatsby, is narrated by a bystander, an observer who makes the acquaintance of a flamboyant, larger-than-life dreamer, this time an immigrant from Trinidad named Chuck Ram Kassoon who will come to signify all of America's possibilities and perils. Netherland was a New York Times top 10 book of 2008, and it won the 2009 Penn Faulkner Award for fiction. Literary critic James Wood called Netherland one of the most remarkable post-colonial books he had ever read. As summarized by Dwight Gardner for the New York Times, the novel's narrator, Hans von der Broek, is a Dutch-born equities analyst who lives in a Tribeca loft with his British-born wife, Rachel, and their son. When 9-11 forces them to flee farther uptown, they end up living almost by accident in the shabby, glamorous Chelsea Hotel, and it is there that their marriage slowly cracks apart. Rachel wants to take their son back to London and her family. He'll be safer there, far from George Bush and the United States, a country she has begun to think of as ideologically diseased. Hans, unsure of his feelings, starts to believe he is a political, ethical idiot. In a recent interview, O'Neill says of his narrator, Hans is a rational guy, but he's rational to the point of passivity, so that when the war beckons, he's almost paralyzed, 
by the question of whether or not it's a worthwhile cause of action. He's paralyzed by the simple thought, unassailably logical, that the validity of the war will depend on its outcome. And the outcome of the war is not foreseeable in advance, it's not predictable. From a logical point of view, his reasoning is sound, but from a political point of view, it's hopeless. His wife takes issue with him for that reason. Hahn's ethical paralysis regarding the war, according to O'Neill, reflects the ethical paralysis of many in the United States while our government moved toward war. As O'Neill told an interviewer, it's very sad to say that after having lived 10 years in America, it increasingly dawns on you how politically undereducated people in this country are. It's a very dangerous thing, especially in combination with the power that the government has. I say this even though I've become anti-anti-American. One does when one starts to live here. I've become American. Indeed, Netherlands is hardly a rant against the narrators and the author's adopted country. Consider the following passage in which Hans gives us a surprisingly affectionate tribute to the much maligned and corporatized Times Square. Unfashionably, I like Times Square in its newest incantation. I had no objection to the Disney Security Corps or the ESPN Zone or the loitering kids crowded outside the MTV studio. And where others felt mocked and diminished by the square's storming of the senses and detected malevolence or Promethean impudence in the molten progress of the news tickers or the 50-foot visages that looked down from vinyl billboards and in the twinkling shouted advertisements for drinks and Broadway musicals, I always regarded these shimmers and vapors as one might the neck feathers of certain of the city's pigeons as natural, humble sources of iridescence. Perhaps as a result of my work, corporations, even those with electrified screens hanging over Times Square, strike me as vulnerable, needy creatures entitled to their displays of vigor. Then again, as Rachel has pointed out, I'm liable to misplace my sensitivities. Such lovely and exact prose can be found on any page and in any paragraph in Netherland. O'Neill says of his prose, what makes a sentence beautiful to me is its conscientiousness. A hip, ironic sensibility is not necessarily conscientious. Neither is a sensibility that latches on to dusks and dawns and roses. A reviewer for NPR commented, if you're going to invoke Gatsby as often as O'Neill does in Netherland, and by the way, Catching all those references to ferry boats, Jewish frontmen, and death by drowning is undeniably part of the insider fun of reading this novel. You'd better be able to acquit yourself honorably against the sheer gorgeousness of Fitzgerald's prose. O'Neill does, and believe me, I can't think of many novelists I would put within spitting distance of Fitzgerald. On his frequent comparisons to Fitzgerald, O'Neill has said, the plot of this book is very similar to The Great Gatsby. You have this charismatic, charismatic gangster figure and his phlegmatic narrator, but it's not a reiteration of that story. The Gatsby-esque narrative of the corrupting of the American dream is premised on the existence of an autonomous, intact America, but there are forces, including 9-11 and the globalization of the economy, which have destroyed that premise and put an end to a hugely significant literary and cultural era of American life. I think the challenge for writers is to explore that and recognize it. Please join me and the Hall Center for the Humanities in welcoming Joseph O'Neill to the University of Kansas. Well, again, thank you all for coming out. And if I may repeat my thanks, this time audibly, to Laura and Victor for um, uh, receiving me so kindly and also to the uh, university uh, for receiving me very kindly. Um, uh, I suppose the reason I'm here is because of this book, Netherland. I can't think of any other reason I might be here. <laughs> um, and I suppose that as a consequence of that, um, I ought to say something about Netherland and about how it came to be written. Um, well, I, I arrived in New York City from uh, London in 1998. And um, my plan, much as, and which is the same year that the, the narrator of that book, Netherland, um, Hans van den Broek, a Dutchman, uh, arrives in, uh, in New York City. And my plan was to spend a couple of years here finishing the, 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 my previous book, which is a non-fiction book 
uh, called Blood Dark Track, and uh, and then to see how that, see see where I was and maybe uh, re return to London and do what I used to do, which is to say combine being a lawyer with being a writer, and to be a, and by lawyer I, I I was the one of those lawyers with the wigs and the gowns. And I still, of course, sound, you know, I have that, the pomposity of the lawyer, uh, which I actually find okay. Um, and, um, but, but what happened is that um, I, I, the first thing I did when I got there, which was May 98, was to uh, do, uh, was to play, try and find a cricket team, which is, I think, um, funny enough, what some, what quite a lot of people do when they come to New York. So I asked my friends, where can I play a game of cricket? And uh, they, they looked at me like I was mad. Um, but I had to play um, because I'd passed every summer of my, of my uh, since, I, since the age of 10, um, uh, playing this sport, which was a synonym as, as for me with, uh, for summer. I mean, summer and cricket went hand in hand. Neither was, I mean, summer without cricket just was, was barely a season at all. So um, I was faced with the problem of trying to play cricket, and so I went to. This was the, this was '98 before um, at the, before I when white pages and yellow pages were still useful points of reference, and when the internet was still relatively, um, you know, uh, relatively youthful, and um, and I looked at the only reference to cricket I could find in the white pages was to the World Cricket League. Now, I was a little daunted about calling the World Cricket League. And it's obviously an, an organization of global importance. And I so, but in the end, I mustered the courage to phone the World Cricket League, which for some reason was stationed in New York. And I, much to my amazement, the, the phone was answered by a man who identified himself as the president of the World Cricket League. <laughs> So I went straight to the top, um, which was very, which was, which was, you know, possibly the first and last time in my life that will happen. And um, the reason I, uh, the reason I went straight to the top was because there was no bottom. Um, this man, a, a Pakistani man called Max, who is, who subsequently became my friend, um, was was the was the basically the was the World Cricket League. <laughs> And um, I, it was his ambition, he told me, to build a cricket stadium in New York. That's the very first conversation I had about cricket. I, of course, I immediately understood myself to be in the presence of a madman. So I, I, I simply said to him, well, where can I play? That's all I, I, you know, good luck with the World Cricket League and your plans to revolutionize everything, basically, as far as I could tell. And, um, and uh, where can I play? And he put me in touch with the Staten Island Cricket Club. Um, which is a, uh, based in Staten Island, and um, and which is a, which is an extraordinary sports club. It was founded in 1872. I have a feeling it's the longest continu existing, continuously active sports club in New York City. It's the oldest, with the possible exception of um, some of the university rowing teams or something. But um, um, back in the day, in 1872, um, cricket was played in the United States, and um, it uh, it was fashionable amongst the upper classes of the United States. And Philadelphia, which is the most upper class of all American cities, uh, and of course class in these senses is often self-designated, um, was, was, was the hotbed for, for American cricket, which was the main sport of the time. And um, main summer sport, certainly. And, um, but there was a such a club, but the Staten Island Cricket Club was a fancy cricket club, and it, it miraculously had survived, and it's now the opposite. It's, it's got zero social cachet. Um, we really are not a very fashionable bunch of people. And I started playing for this, for this club, and um, it was um, only after two years or three years of playing, maybe only after two seasons, I suppose, or three seasons maybe, that I began to ask myself whether there wasn't something worth writing about here. And, um, and I began to think a little more 
in a very different way about, about what I was doing. Until then, it had been a recreational thing. And um, what was interesting, of course, was that um, uh, <laughs> I'm not in. Um, what was interesting was that um, cricket is 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 is, uh, is is an immigrant sport in the United States, and uh, what was interesting about the sport was how it was played by people who came from all over the world and who were um, invisible in all sorts of ways to the host culture. And um, and it was at that time that I remembered this crazy guy I'd spoken to a few years back who had this ambition to build a world cricket league. And so I started a plot, started to vaguely materialize in my mind. And um, it was also around this time that I re began to um, think about Trinidad in connection with this book. When I was a lawyer, I did mainly business law, commercial uh, disputes, fascinating stuff. Um, uh, but on, but uh, a very small part of my practice was, was devoted to, the death, to death penalty cases. And um, it, London, the Supreme Court in London effectively is the last court of appeal for many former colonies who have chosen to retain that judicial link with uh, the United Kingdom simply because um, they don't trust their own courts to be um, beyond, uh, you know, to be, to be beyond um, suspicion. And, um, and as a consequence, um, there are death penalty appeals which uh, land up in London. And I was in work in a chambers which did that work. And so from time to time, I don't know why, I began to get letters from men, and they, they were always men, on death row in Trinidad. And it's quite something to receive a letter from, from one of these men because um, they write the letters on these special envelopes, um, which you write on them, and then you fold it up, and then you mail it. Air letters, I think they're called. And in Trinidad, these letters uh, were, were imprinted with images of birds because Trinidad is a famous island for birds, apparently. And, um, and of course, there's, a, there's an obvious irony in uh, these creatures of, of so famously associated with freedom, etc., um, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, these, being on these letters, which when you open them would, all, would, all, would invariably be decorated with drawings of flowers and, and, and birds, and, in the, and, and the letter itself would be usually um, hopelessly confused and desperate um, uh, invitation to take an interest in their, in, in, in their plight. Anyhow, um, well, I had a client in Trinidad, and I went to see him. And when I arrived in Trinidad, I met I saw that there was one person in Trinidad, in Trinidad who was opposed to the death penalty, apart from the Catholic Archbishop. And that was a man named Ishmael Samad. And he came to my attention because just as I arrived in Trinidad, they'd just finished hanging nine men in three days. And so the island was in a state of um, agitation as a result of this. It's quite something on a small island to hang nine men in three days. And... Um, and this man, Ishmael, who's now a very good friend of mine, um, I saw from the newspaper. I saw him in the newspaper. Would stand outside the jail with quotes from Arthur Kostler written on enormous placards. And I thought to myself, "Hello, this is this this is an interesting guy." This is before. This is back in uh, when was this? This might have been in 1999, possibly 2000. Uh, anyway, it was before I wrote Netherland. And um, I th and I wanted to meet him, and I got to meet him, and it turned out that he was a um, nature guide by profession. And one of the things which Ishmael did in the 70s uh, was take an interest in the um, fate of the giant turtles that have the, the, the biggest sea turtles in the world that nest on the, north, on the beaches of northern Trinidad. 
and they arrive on the shore, on the beaches, and what would happen to these gigantic turtles, who could be two or three hundred years old, was that poachers would, we uh, would wait them, await them with machetes, or cutlasses as they're called in Trinidad, and they would chop their heads off, gigantic creatures, uh, in order to eat them. Because Trinidad is a poor island, and people, um, you know, are creative when it comes to finding food. And there was no government protection for these turtles. And so what Ishmael did, and he's a small fellow, small guy, of, of East, uh, East Indian origin, as they say in Trinidad, um, is that he, he uh, in the absence of it, there was no government protection, as I said, he, 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 he put together some sort of khaki suit, pretended to be a game warden, and in the middle of the night, would travel to these remote beaches and on his own, and patrol the beaches on his own. And when he saw poachers, he would ask them to, not to poach. These are men with machetes. That, I've been to those beaches, they are frightening places. You have to wade through mangrove swamps to get to them. Just imagine for a moment what, what it takes to do that. Anyhow, it turned out that, that um, Ishmael had left school at 14, that he'd educated himself by working in a bookstore, and, and that he was extremely well-read, uh, if, if, you know, unpredictably well-read sort of guy, uh, who was, on, on top of it all, an amateur theologian. And so I thought to myself, I remembered him, and I thought to myself, if this man can exist, and if the other fellow can exist, Chuck Rampersoon can exist. And um, and so um, it, it so happened that in addition to this, I, I, I also had other, I knew a lot about Trinidad from other, a lot of the guys on my cricket team were from Trinidad, and we'd gone to Trinidad, and I'd, you know, I'd be stayed in the countryside. These are not rich guys with their family on the floor with the chickens and all the rest of it. So I had a pretty good idea of, 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 um, of Trinidad. And um, I started to write, so, so this character, Chuck Ramkissoon, um, formed in my mind. And um, <clears throat> it was then that I, um, oh, then 9-11 happened. And since I was writing about New York and the cricket world, it, was, it seemed to me, um, obviously, that that was uh, impossible to disentangle from this catastrophic and horrible crime, which, it was, which is what it was. And, um, of course, you know, um, like, like everybody else, it, you know, living there, and I suspect living here, um, you, it, there wasn't... You know, you're certainly living in New York. You um, didn't writing novels was not your priority for a, a while. Um, but when it when I went back to work, I, I, I thought to myself that it was impossible to, to to not write about New York City as it had been changed. Um, and of course, what quickly happened after 9/11 was that there were two wars, and so the the events kept changing and developing. And I suppose that contributed to why to, to the fact that it took me seven eight years to write this novel. Meanwhile, I, uh, I had to find a narrator uh, for this book, and um, I, I thought to myself, well, first of all, I, I thought, what was, who's going to tell the story? And I was already under the impression that I was, you know, writing a novel about cricket. You know, when I mentioned it to one or two friends, they, they, they sort of recoiled they thought I was, you know, mad. And um, uh, particularly since I was giving up a legal career in London in order to write a novel set in the world of New York cricket. I mean, it, so I thought, why not? Why not? If I'm, if I'm going to sort of go mad, why not just completely uh, just go the whole way and have my narrator be a Dutchman? So that I was writing a novel told by a Dutchman set in the world of New York cricket. Um, not exactly the sort of thing which... Um, you know, as editors sort of tossing restlessly in their sleep, deciding how much they can bid for the book. Um, but the point is that the reason I had a Dutchman, I had, there were all sorts of reasons for having the Dutchman, but the, 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 the personal one was that I grew up in, I'd grown up in Holland, and um, in The Hague specifically. And The Hague was a quiet, very orderly, well-behaved sort of place catastrophic from the budding novelist's point of view. 
What you really want is a sort of tumultuous place full of hatred and sort of, dis and sort of unrest, a place that sort of dramatizes the great problems of humanity. The Hague dramatizes all the great solutions of humanity. So there just isn't very much to write about. And, um, and, and on top of it all, my parents may have, you know, were guilty of, uh, you know, of a very serious offense against art, namely that they, that they gave me a very happy childhood. So, um, and, on, and on top of all of that, is the non-existent readership known as the readers who are interested in novels about The Hague. Even Dutch readers balk at novels about The Hague. Um, but, and of course as a consequence of all that, I was deprived of the asset that most novelists have, which is to write something about their childhood in Montana where they went fishing with their dad. Or, um, you know, or, you know, uh, anyway, they're all, we, we know, we, every novelist is, except me, had the good fortune to write about, I wasn't going to, you know, to write about, a, a, to write, to set their novels in a world which was recognizable um, by, by a, at least some readers. Um, but with this novel, I finally thought, here is my chance to put that entirely useless childhood of Meg to use. Um, because, of course, um, the Dutch viewpoint is the original colonial viewpoint on America. And, um, and you know, uh, it was a sort of, um, and it was, as I said, an, an opportunity at last for me to draw on memories of, of, of my own childhood. And so um, I had this, I had these two main characters and I, I, I spent a number of years uh, writing I suppose, <laughs> um, and finally, um, and finally had the good fortune, and it was good fortune to uh, find an agent, which is what I mean. I know I'm, I'm, I'm dwelling on this because I know people are always curious about the, the publishing side of writing. Um, in my case, I didn't have any agent in New York City, and um, and of course, very few. No, no one was in. And, and when I did get an agent, it was rejected by every publisher, publisher except one. Thankfully, that's all you need. <laughs> and um, and so it was. Um, it was. Um, it was ac accepted by this publisher, and uh, by a further coincidence, the head of the publishing house was a cricket fanatic, and um, that I don't think harmed the situation. And I was very lucky that the right critics read the book and gave it the sort of um, critical uh, reception, which I suppose, looking back, it seems fantastical to me now. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Some glitch in the system. And, um, and so I ended up with this book, uh, which was um, read uh, by, which found readers, which was a new experience for me. Um, I mean, I, I ought to emphasize that you know, the no what it is to be a novelist uh, for 99% of us. Uh, being a novelist means, uh, in my case, or being a writer means having written three books and not having, I was outside my immediate family and friends, not having met a single person who's read any of them. <laughs> not only that, in all those years of writing, I had not met a single person who said, I haven't read any of your books, but I'm aware that you've written one or two books. I hadn't even met that person. <laughs> so it becomes a fairly abstract sort of activity after a while. Um, and when you reach the, your 40s, as I did writing this book, you, you become slightly more um, interested, in my case at least, in uh, what happens to it in the world of publishing and in the world of readers. And so it was gratifying uh, when this book um, uh, you know, found found readers and and and, and so forth, and um, um, and then I then I had the surreal experience when the paperback came out of of, of, of watching uh, getting these clips, watching these clips on YouTube or whatever of the President Obama talking about the book, uh, which was an extremely odd feeling to have the distance between yourself and the president suddenly collapse. 
but it collapsed in a way which also makes you question the president. Surely he has better things to be doing. I mean, there was a financial crisis on at that point. Surely the president has better things to be doing than reading this novel, and certainly talking about the novel. Um, uh, but apparently not. <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, apparently not. But my, 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 it is, it, for me, it was, an, it was enormously flattering, of course, that this particular president should have read it, because I always felt that if, um, if there was one sort of person who understood, um, who might have understood, one American who might have understood cricket, it was President Obama. Um, uh, not least, isn't it? He's half Kenyan as well, right? Or uh, ancestrally, and of course, that's that's a cricket country. They play cricket there, so he might, he might a bit, a bit of the old uh, might be. It's obviously in his blood somewhere, um, uh, and so and so that 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 is the story of of, of how that particular um, book came to be uh, written. Um, I, you know, a writer, uh, the question, you know, people, I suppose there might be the expectation among some of you that, you know, he's going to talk about this book. Um, well, I was reading something the other day, and it was a wonderful quote by Nietzsche. He says that a person is, re uh, is least related to his parents. And um, now he, Nietzsche uh, wrote that. Um, rather interesting statement, not uh, partly because he hated his mother, and he couldn't believe that this was his mother. And in fact, he hated his sister as well. He hated them. And in fact, he thought that he had this theory of, of the recurrence of life, the eternal recurrence of life, and he said the only possible argument against that theory I can think of is my mother and my sister. I couldn't believe that these people would eternally recur. So horrible were they. Um, but he loved his father. Um, and, but his, his idea was that he was related essentially to um, Julius Caesar and people like this. I mean, obviously he was a slightly... The book was entitled Why I Am So Wise, uh, which is, a, which, you know, I wish writers had the balls to write, the, uh, to write, to write books like that. They merely get at you subliminally. Um, but at least Nietzsche was out there. He really did think he was very wise. Um, but, it, it, but, I, but all of this bears to the question of the, the parenthood of a novel. And in a way, um, although I've described the rather, you know, the series of accidents and, um, and I suppose the work, I haven't really d touched on the work, but it's, you know, writing novels is it's, it's hard. It's very, very difficult. It's irreducibly difficult in a way. Um, once the novel is is done, um, you you cease to have th this parental authority over it. Uh, people, of course, readers often want you to have it. They want you to explain the novel to them, to explain what this is about. And it's it's true that that the novel that the author has a privileged critical perspective on the work in question because he wrote it and because he read it. A lot of critics may not not so privileged. <laughs> Um, and so the author may or may not have interesting things to say about it, but um, it's impossible to ask, I think, uh, to, to, to ex it's impossible to expect a, to, a, a writer to kind of explain a book, because um, the whole point of writing a novel is to flee the world of explanations, to flee the world of, of, of reductive statements, and to instead bring into this world this object, the novel, um, which has these extraordinary um, powers, which 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 uh, alternative forms of communication, such as critical uh, exegesis, for example, uh, don't have. Uh, so, in other words, there's no there's a, any explanation of a novel is going to be um, lacking in the enormous vitality of the novel itself by comparison with the explanation. It's like you go to a party, 
and lots of things happened at the party, and it was a fun night, and it was kind of magical night. The music was good, of, you know, it was good things to drink, there some people meeting each other, and it was it was adventurous. And you, and then if you try to, rec- and then of course afterwards, if you try to recount what happened, you were all saying, well, you know, I got there at eight, and there was the he, he, X was there, and Y was there, and it doesn't capture what happened. Same thing with, with criticism, I suppose, and um, and so um, it's it's. Uh, it's this kind of mystery which interests me. This kind of this 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 entity of the novel, which is so much more powerful than its writer, and ultimately unrelated to the writer because it's just a text. I mean, it literally is a text which floats around the world. And when the reader has the the novel in his or her hands, there is no novelist. It's just the novel. And when I was growing up, I was fantastically uninterested uh, in the uh, in the biographical circumstances of the novelist. Um, you know, I, there would be, Saul Bellow for me was merely a, a, this black and white fellow going like this. <laughs> you know, Philip Roth was this. Uh, and uh, I'm just trying to think, John Updike had a friendly smile on his face. And then of course, you know, we, who knows what Shakespeare looked like. So, um, so um, it's, uh, it's, so that when I talk about the novel as I've done, it's, it's, it, it, it's in order simultaneously, I suppose, to, to demystify the process which gives rise to a novel. And at the same time, I suppose, to emphasize the, the, the mystery of the novel itself, the authority that a novel has um, or can have. Of course, there are terrible novels out there as well. There are novels that send you right to sleep. Um, uh, but, it, but, but, but the hope of the novelist is, is, is that something will be, something will be born uh, and that um, it, it will bear no relation. It will, it will not be related to him or her. Um, but the, what the, I suppose the question then arises to what is a novel related? What is, the, what, what is a novel related to? And, um, you know, where is the, who or what is the author of a novel? Um, and of course, the primary author, after it's finished and published, and hopefully read, is the reader. So that, for example, I mean, I see some youthful faces back here, and there's a sort of, uh, I remember uh, having a youthful face once, <laughs> and uh, I remember having um, thought at that time that, you know, that, that a novel is, or a piece of art is something that you decode, and that there's the intention and that the, the, one of the great objectives is to is to try and un- understand the intention of the novelist. Um, you know, intentions are worthless in the end. They're just a complete. Well, it was my intention to write about that the novel should be about X, Y, or Z, and well, you know, or, uh, that's interesting to know. But if it's not there, or it was never my intention to write about A, B, and C. Well, well then, what's this? So, um, so that the reader, the reader is the primary, is, is, becomes the author of the novel and the author of its meaning and the, and the author of it. And, and, and what, is, what is created is not, the, not a new novel, of course, but what is created is a new experience and an experience particular to every person. And, that's, and it's namely the experience of being in the presence of the novel and being you and the novel being it and um, there being, a, 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 I suppose what you could say is, is an entirely unprecedented uh, chemical situation. <laughs> no one in the history of the world has been in that. No, there's no phenomenon which has been that before. And, um, and, um, and so uh, this question of um, decoding the novel and intentionality is a very interesting question. Um, now, intention is something that uh, I, I first thought of as a lawyer. And intent, for example, when you plan to murder somebody, you intend to do it. Um, but, um, but you see, um, unfortunately, it's easier to murder somebody than it is to write a novel. <laughs> It may not, and it's even, I mean, although it's easier to get away with a novel, I think. Um, um, you know, you can have all the best plans in the world, and then, uh, and then um, 
and then the novel essentially assumes its own life. And for example, um, uh, I had never foreseen that I had never intended to write a novel about 9-11. And, and in the end, apparently, that's what I did. Um, it, it was only after I was finished and people started saying, well, you know, this is a, is, this is a 9-11 novel. I wasn't even aware that there was such a thing. Um, and so, um, uh, it's not, it's not, um, so the question of intent, I, I just, just going back to that again, is, 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 the, is, is, is important and has a certain validity, but it, it's, it doesn't account for, um, it doesn't account for uh, the novel. In fact, you might even define the novel as that which is not intended by the author. Because anything he intends to say, if you know something clearly enough as to intend to say it, then you might as well write an essay. Or you might as well just say it. What makes the novel novel uh, is is, uh, is is that it's 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 beyond the powers of of, of intent. Of course, <coughs> you know the reason why certain novelists write one good novel after another, uh, rather the, the fact that that happens rather suggests that you know um, some people are, are are better than others at um, at managing the unknown, um, and I think that's the great that's the great challenge. Um, which is to is to manage the unknown. Um, <clears throat> now the, um, quite, the Netherlands. So so in other words, all of this all of this chattering I've been doing in the last five minutes is is a way of saying that I, I I'm I, I'm what I'm not going to talk about today is what Netherlands means. Uh, but what I was talking about is uh, how it came about. By contrast. And I and I kind of draw and, and this 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 relates to Netherland. Um, in understanding how the book came about, um, I also have to go back to the book I wrote before, which is I suppose the the other mature work I've written. My first two novels are thankfully out of print. There's a horrible I heard a horrible rumor that they'd, they'd be back in print in this country at some point, but um, so far so good. No sign of them. Um, uh, by contrast, Blood Dark Track, which is a horrible title, but incidentally, it's, it's practically unsayable, um, is, uh, has been reissued. And um, as I, it's, the story of my, it's the story of how I uh, came to look into uh, the history, the, the story of my two grandfathers, both of whom I didn't know. One was Irish and one was Turkish. The Turkish grandfather was imprisoned by the British during the war, interned, I should say, for four or five years on suspicion of being a Nazi spy. The Irish grandfather was simultaneously and coincidentally imprisoned, and I should say again, interned to be, to be correct, um, on suspicion of being an IRA activist. And these were both shameful secrets, as it were, um, or that's how I understood them in my family. And so I, um, I began to ask questions about it. And um, and what I learned is that, um, and this is uh, and this is why I, I what I learned is is that uh, these two men in the Second World War um, were, in fact, stood for opposites of political uh, of, of of stood for opposites, I should say, on the political of, of political activism. Uh, my Irish grandfather was an IRA man, which is, which is to say, he d he believed firmly in the um, in the responsibility and power of the individual to affect history, namely by killing people. Um, uh, or which in that, that is up for what primarily distinguishes the IRA from its uh, non-lethal uh, Republican uh, counterparts. My Turkish grandfather, by, on the other hand, was a hotelier. And he was an extremist too. He was an extremist in, in, in bystanding. He was, uh, he's just, so during the Second World War, he, um, he decided at the height of the war to go to what was then called Palestine and to buy lemons there. And what had happened was that there was a citrus fruit uh, disaster in Turkey, 
Meanwhile, the citrus fruit of, of Palestine was literally on mountains, was piled so high that the, the planes overhead could see them because the war had destroyed the export markets and it was all stuck there in Palestine. So he thought if he went to Palestine and bought 200 tons of lemons and, and bought them back to Turkey and sold them for 10 times the price, he'd make a fortune. And he was right about that. Uh, unfortunately, he, um, he was arrested by the British on his way back. And um, he uh, was then, and then and he disappeared for a number of years. Um, it was very hard for my grandmother to track him down. Now, I only found out about the story in my 20s when I was in Turkey. Um, and two things happened in my, I go to Turkey every year because my mother's Turkish. Two things, the only two things that happen in Turkey are eating and swimming. So anything not connected to eating and swimming just doesn't happen. And so what occurred on this occasion is I went to the attic of my grandmother's house in order to find snorkels, you see, swimming. And, um, and what I found instead was a, a diary written by my grandfather, an account of his arrest and imprisonment. And um, where he described how he'd been tortured and so forth, and how he was innocent, he wasn't a Nazi. <coughs> but eventually what, what transpired was that this book into, into, this, into this grandfather's became <coughs> essentially an examination of the fragility of the individual conscience in the face of history. And um, it was published in 2000. And one, I should say, it was published in 2001, two months after 9-11, even though it was written before that. And my thought is that um, <coughs> if I really, and, I've, and I say this in, in the preface of this new book, if I've written a 9-11 book, it's blood dark track rather than Netherlands. Um, because it's, um, I just noticed there's water here. I was told about it. Not my, sorry, it's not your fault. <coughs> And I think that what unites these two books, and, and, and possibly what ties them to the book, which I have not yet written, but which I'm uh, working on at the moment, is this, conti is this continuing, and I suppose unanswerable question of, um, the, and drama, I should say, because novels are ultimately concerned with drama, is the, is the unanswerable drama, an unending drama of the individual and um, in an in, in individual and and history, essentially, as it happened, um, and um, and I'd say, so so and I and I think I'd, and that's where I propose to leave it now. Although I'm sure there are there are questions that um, that will be asked. Uh, I'm in, I, I'm sort of um, I'm in the middle, really. Um, I, I I believe I I, I, I I certainly believe in, in political. Um, to be, to be that we ought, one ought to be alive politically, um, which my Turkish grandfather wasn't really in a position to believe because he belonged to a small minority in, in Turkey which couldn't put its head over the parapet. Um, but, I, but I do think that, uh, and neither do I believe in the um, in my Irish grandfather's um, idea that you know political violence is. Uh, you know, something one should resort to readily. Um, I happen to believe that um, now that we have the real example of, of a peaceful um, protest and a real example from Gandhi and Martin Luther King and so forth, how effective this can be, that um, there's almost no moral case for political violence unless you've exhausted that remedy. And it's amazing how few people do it. And I suppose it takes a charismatic person of the kind I've just mentioned, to, 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 make, to make that tactic even possible as an agent of political change. Well, I mean, you know, the book, a book resonates not only with the, you know, the private experiences of the reader, but it also resonates and draws its meaning from um, the relationship of the book with other books. And, and, and because books don't come into existence um, from a vacuum, they, even the most a radical um, book, a radically different and uh, innovative book, well, it, well, is written in, 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 a, in a very clear tradition. And, um, and there's a whole um, way in which you can, uh, you know, um, there's, there's, there, are, there are all sorts of ways in which you can enrich your sense of, of the world and of, of, of the books in the world by, by, by connecting 
various texts to one another. I mean, the book which um, it was mentioned in the, by, by Laura, the book which this book has been most frequently connected to is, is The Great Gatsby. And, um, and, and, and in a way, rightly so, not because of my book is anything, isn't it any good as The Great Gatsby, but because it, it, a lot of the territory is, is, um, is, is, is similar. In fact, I went to um, a performance of a play called The Gats recently. And The Gats is a seven-hour reading of The Great Gatsby, of every word in The Great Gatsby. And I haven't read The Great Gatsby for many years. Um, certainly not while I was writing Netherlands, because I, I was thinking, I don't want to go near there. It's too, it's too, it's kind of, I, I knew I was in a, in a very charged relationship with that book, and I didn't want to, get, to make it too charged. And um, as I was listening, I, I realized to my horror and delight, well, first of all, I realized that there were scenes in that, in that novel which are eerily even more, I mean, I, there were one of the conscious references to the Atsby, but that was it. But I hadn't realized quite how much my novel had drawn from it subconsciously. But there was, can, does anyone know, this is a little liter literary quiz, where cricket appears in the Great Gatsby? I will tell you. Cricket appears in the photograph of Gatsby at Oxford, where he's said to be leaning against a cricket bat. And I was thinking, God, I never even, I didn't know that. And I always thought Fitzgerald never wrote about cricket. Well, I was wrong. In fact, The Great Gatsby is, in fact, about cricket. <laughs> now, you could take that back to, the, uh, to your teachers and, and, and uh, lecturers. You know, as, as, as Victor rightly pointed out, and I think you'll find that the reference to the cricket bat is right in the middle of the book. Everything revolves <laughs> around the cricket bat. Oh, and which reminds me that I once played cricket against Harold Pinter. He was, too, let me put it this way, he was a terrific playwright. <laughs> <laughs> the question was whether, uh, you know, with reference to my, uh, with what I'd said about the, the experience, the particular experience of, of a reader with a particular novel, um, were there any, are there any novels that I've written, I've read? <laughs> Uh, that are particular, that, that, which, which have been an important experience for me, and um, I, and I can I am I can honestly say this. You see, we go back to the same theme again. Um, I can honestly say that I was a dunce at English literature until I read Portrait of the Artist, the Young Man. I was, you know, I would go to. I kept getting all these C's, and even though I was, you know, you know, I was trying reasonably hard. And then I read Paul Rose as the artist as a young man, and in fact, the passage which really woke me up and alerted me to the a whole world, it was like an Aladdin's cave moment, um, that language was unto itself, and the language of possibilities unto, unto itself, was the scene in which Stephen is walking around his boarding school, and he hears the pick and the pock of the cricket bats. <laughs> Again, you see, it all comes back. If you read the Bible, you'll see that <laughs> when Jesus talks of the. <laughs> um, so, um, and so that for me really was an extraordinary experience. I really entered with that, especially the first half of that book. Uh, I really entered, it really was an extraordinary experience. And I suddenly thought I was interested in, in reading and writing. And my kind of intelligence went just went just blossomed at that point, um, and then. I, and, but I, but I, the, the the what I also read a lot and continue to read is, is, is poetry. And um, I think the first love I would I would have thought. I mean, I hate being prescriptive, but I would really would have thought a, a novelist's first love should be with the with the language. Otherwise, why choose the medium? And of course, you can't. You know, you you start. So if you you start off with a love of language, and um, an interest in language, and from there you um, you move towards um, subjects. I think you're much better off as a novelist doing that than starting off with a subject and then moving towards language. And um, 
Um, so that so there's and then the, which poets did I like? I used to, I loved American poets. Funny enough, um, I used to love, I loved Langston Hughes. When I was sixteen. I thought I was so seventeen. I still do. Nothing wrong with Langston Hughes. Sylvia Plath. I still think Sylvia Plath is underrated. Um, and um, all sorts of people. Uh, Seamus Heaney. Lots of Irish writers. The poet I like reading now is Paul Muldoon. Is an extraordinary writer, and uh, this stuff is magical. And what I'm also reading now, as I was talking, as I mentioned just to a few people at dinner this evening, is what I'm reading now, and, and I'm reading it with a with the viewpoint not of understanding anything I'm reading, but with the viewpoint of just um, having a new experience with the language and the thinking. Is I'm reading lots of uh, philosophy. Um, but I love the prose. And I love the uh, way in which um, uh, it, it's, it's just a different way of thinking about the world, and at the same time, it's intensely preoccupied with language, philosophy. It's all about being. Uh, they obs obs they're obsessed. They're even more obsessed than than lawyers are. So we got a question. Um, and what you just spoke about, something that has stuck with me about the entire presentation is the comments that Professor Moriarty made in her introduction about your thoughts on conscientiousness in good sentences. And so, given so much debate that people have had in recent years about the level of political discourse in the United States or elsewhere, where do you feel the uh, position of language in communication in discourse and dialogue is for us um, as readers, as writers, as participants in society. Thank you. Um, well, that's a big question. Um, I'm tempted to talk about politics, but I'm not sure I have anything interesting that I want you to say on that. So, oh, but, but then again, if that if that were the if that were the you know the test for me saying anything, I'd just be quiet. Um, because I think, but, um, but just on the, what it means to write a conscientious sentence, it's not necessarily a sentence which is conscientious in relation to the oppressed of the world, but it, it, it's a sentence which is conscientious as in, in the matter of language and meaning, um, which is to say, um, ideally, Ideally, you want to write, the, you want to kind of excavate the sentence. Only that sentence, there's a, there's a sort of logic to every word choice. And you want, you want, ideally you want the word to be logical and meaningful. And you don't want it just to be pretty and, and sort of, you know, attractive. You want it to be precise. And um, I think what often passes for um, fine writing, or why people enjoy fine writing, uh, is that if they look at it carefully, it's very accurate. So that it can be, I'm looking at Fitzgerald, for example, I was listening to it being read out loud. I mean, a lot of it is, uh, there's lots of twi he worked the word twilight appears a million times in that novel. He, and he must have known what he was doing, because it becomes, it's so repetitive that you, that you think, um, and moonlight. There's lots of moonlight in it. People are always in. The, there's always a little sliver of moonlight between the characters, and um, but that's not. And so you then say, well, if he's if he's repeating the word twilight so often, he's offending against, you know, the basic writing rule against repetition. Um, until and then until you realise that what he's doing, a you realise that it's not that. It doesn't feel offensive to the reader. And B, you realize that um, he's writing conscientiously, even if it means repeating himself, and even if it means using a slightly, you know, purple, pur pinky, purpley prose word like twilight. Um, because he's actually concerned with twilight, literally, and, and, and twilight in, in all sorts of ways, and he's sprinkling that word repeatedly in the, in the novel because of his interest in the Crepuscular, <laughs> um, and so he's so so. Th th there's and then again, and the other thing I, the one thing which bothers me too, which makes me which makes me a terrible and, sh and appalling reader of novels these days, 
is that I um, I can read a page and I can just think, you know, um, that sentence shouldn't be there. That's that. Why, why that shouldn't be there? That sentence shouldn't be there. That should. And I just think, well, why would they do that? Why would they? Why would they leave those sentences in there when when they shouldn't be? Um, and the thing that really, I, what I love is those, is those. One, one thing I love about reading philosophy is that I, I kind of, the, the, I, I'm not, I'm not reading it as a, as a practitioner, as a writer. I'm just reading it as, a, as a kind of fan. I'm in a state of, you know, enormous inferiority in relation to the, to the, to the author of those texts. Um, but um, so conscientiousness is, is doing your best to. Um, to write, ex to write as exactly as you can, and to write, and to write in a way which is, uh, which is as commensurate as possible to what it is you're, you're trying to describe. Of course, it's a total failure. I mean, I read Netherland now, and I just think I, th I read it like all these other books. Oh my God, what's that doing there? And before you know it, you've got nothing left. Um, but you, and you have to write something ultimately. Unfortunately. Most of the um, people you've been talking about tonight um, are male. And in Netherlands, apart from the wife of the Dutchman, I can't think of many female characters of any real strength in Netherlands. Do you find it hard to write through female characters? Well, I don't write, I don't try, I, I've never written through one. Um, uh, there is the mother. There is the mother, who I think is an important character in Netherland. But then again, mothers are not the same, are they? Um, mothers are special. Um, I mean, I think it's. I, I write. I write very obvious. I write. I, I would never write. I don't think through the eyes of a of a woman, because um, I feel that um, there is a distinctive consci consci There is a distinctive sort of consciousness. Um, between men and women, and um, and it's worth exploring it. And I feel authorized to write about the male point of view. I don't feel particularly authorized to write about the, the, the female point of view. On the other hand, I love reading women writers. I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, not, I was talking again. I was talking about this earlier this evening. There's lots, so many wonderful female novelists who I think um, are not. Lionized in the way that, or lionessenized in the way that uh, their male counterparts are, even though they might be better. And I'm thinking, uh, and I, the one, one of the cases that I was thinking about when I was talking about it was Muriel Spark, who's just an extraordinary novelist. And, and yet, although she was very famous during her lifetime, has not, has not apparently um, survived. It's not, people don't talk about her, people don't seem to be reading her. You know, she's extraordinary. I mean, writers read her, all writers, writers read me on Spark a lot because they can steal lots of tricks from her. Um, but I mean, no, I mean, it's, uh, I, look, it, look, it's entirely possible that, you know, if you, if you think that you ought to maximize, well, first of all, the, the sort of basic starting point for writing for me is that you have to write as much as possible from your fundamental obsessions. And, um, and you have to write as much as possible from uh, the most truthful possible place you can write from. And um, I know that Flaubert did it. <laughs> but Madame Bovary, but obviously he's a bit of a genius, and it's unfair to expect the rest of us to do it. Of course, Shakespeare did it. Geniuses have done it. Male ge genius male writers have done it, uh, Molly Bloom, um, etc. But I think there are very few examples amongst even extremely brilliant, wonderful writers who are men of, um, of, of having convincing um, um, female characters, convincing not, a, not and convincing in a mis, in a in a in a in a in a in a way which doesn't involve them being well behaved. You know, I could, we could all write a novel about the sort of the, the bien passant female protagonist who sort of, you know, thinks the nice thoughts and does the right thing. And yes, I've written a novel about women, which is nice about women, but 
Uh, it's not, that's nothing. I don't think that. I don't think women particularly want to read that. Uh, or, and neither do men. And likewise, I don't think uh, it's 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 difficult. I think it's difficult for for, for female writers to write um, convincingly from the male viewpoint. It just is. Um, they just won't have access to certain things. It's just it's just it's the way it is. Um, one can have access to to, to 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 quite a lot of things, but but not maybe to the deepest and darkest energies. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>